If you want to push your rifle skills to the max, Precision Rifle Series is something you have to experience. Join me, Gavin Gear from UltimateReloader.com, as I discuss with Jim Finlay, my shooting mentor, the gear that's needed to succeed in this sport. Down with a lot of force and over to the. So I'm here again with my shooting partner and friend, Jim Finlay. We're talking about my first PRS match. In the last video, we talked about the experience, getting ready, preparing, practicing, the whole end-to-end -end experience. And this time, we're gonna talk about the gear. And there's a lot of places that you can go online to talk about gear and to read up on it, learn about it. Uh, a couple sources I would recommend would be Cal Zant has a blog called the Precision Rifle Blog. A lot of great info there, including what the pros use. He has a lot mm -hmm. of different compilations of stuff there. Uh, Ed Mobley and Steve Lawrence have the 6.5 guys, which is a little bit more video based, and they have a blog as well. Tons and tons and tons of information. But what I thought we could do is just kind of walk through the basics of each of the components in your gear collection for a PRS match and talk a little bit about what we use, a little bit about how we selected the gear, the pros and cons, maybe a little bit about what we'd like to use next. So thank you, Jim, for sure. joining me. Absolutely. Uh, why don't we start with rifles? How do you think about which rifle to put together the different options that you have, that kind of thing? Sure. Well, there, as you see here, there's two rifle platforms. One is a bolt action, the other is semi-automatic. They both have the pros and cons. Um, you'll tend to see more of the uh, bolt-action rifles than you will the semi-autos in uh, most of these competitions. And once again, there's pros and cons to both of those. Uh, in my experience, the bolt gun's a little bit easier to run over the semi-automatic. Mm -hmm. Not that you can't get the semi-auto to stay with a bolt gun, but you definitely need, in my opinion, quite a bit more time behind mm -hmm. the trigger. So, um, I, I would say that I would, I would have found the same thing, uh, just in even practicing, you know, keeping like an AR-15, for example, on target. We've talked about the dynamics of the first shot and the last shot and mm -hmm. how that affects the rifle's follow through. And you can see that on the groups and, and all that. Um, it was a little bit easier for me to hold my position with a, a semi-auto. Um, I shot this AR-15, which is chambered in 22 Nosler. And overall, it did, it did really well. Mm -hmm. But when I go back to a bolt gun, it, it just feels like everything's a bit more clamped down and a bit more steady. You, you have a pretty high-end setup going on here, and it's got a heavier stock. It's got just total stability and a really, really light, really glassy smooth trigger as well. Yes, that's correct. I think trigger's running about eight ounces. It's a jewel. <laughs> so this rifle platform here, bolt action, it's an Arbro's Rogue action that Arbro's put together for me um, with a 22-inch rotten eight-twist barrel. And then I have the, uh, the suppressor on there, and which um, I prefer to shoot suppressed over mm -hmm. the brake rifles, just because of uh, less fatigue on the on the shooter, uh, less less noise. The recoil is about the same, maybe a little more with the with the suppressor mm -hmm. than with the brake. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'll trade that off with uh, with the the fatigue that you get running yeah. the brake over a period of a day, especially if you've got a covered uh, shooting area yeah. that you're shooting. So. And you're chambered uh, in 6.5x47 Lapua, which is yes, that's similar correct. similar to 6.5 Creedmoor, but yes, absolutely. slightly more, more optimized. Yeah, there's a, just a couple things that, that makes me stay with a 6.5x47, and that is barrel life. You get a little more barrel life with a 6.5x47 over the Creedmoor. And uh, and you get the accuracy is a little bit easier to get a hold of hmm. right out the gate than the, than the Creedmoor. Mm -hmm. um, the Creedmoor is no slouch for any stretch, and that, that is... There's a lot of people shooting those, especially with yeah. uh, with quite a few off-the-shelf rifles available. Yep. The 6.5x47 is a reloader's only. There's not any factory ammunition that will uh, that will keep you in the competition. Yeah. And like you've mentioned several times, things like the wind, the stopwatch, uh, you know, keeping just keeping the sto scope steady, shooting off of some of the barricades, and this this kind of stuff would be have a lot more Safe. impact on your score than. 65 by 47 Lapua versus 65 Creedmoor, right? Abs absolutely, yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah you, you can, if you're shooting a half minute gun or better, mm -hmm. um, then it's not going to be the gun. Yeah. It's and you, the you could shoot something like 243 Winchester and have a super flat trajectory and then just be prepared to have your rifle rebarreled more frequently, right? Yes, that's correct, absolutely. <laughs> and there's quite a few of the guys running six millimeter mm -hmm. and they all have pros and cons. So the 6.5s have a little bit heavier bullet. 
which on paper don't necessarily show they have more uh, energy downrange um, and more more dust signature, but you definitely have with the heavier bullets, the 130s, the 140s, 147s, mm -hmm. 143s out of the 6.5, just have a better signature on target than the 6mm. And so uh, pros and cons there, some, well, not all the matches, but most of the matches that shoot long will have some kind of a, a light system or some kind of a reactive system on the targets at range, so that makes it easier for the RO to score hits and misses. Hmm. Hmm. So your rifle is a completely different profile than an AR-15. One thing that I found was, you know, when you have a Picatinny rail all over the place and that kind of thing, there's there's more of a likelihood for things to get caught on the rifle and it's not as smooth to handle, maybe even off the barricade. Um, your stock is pretty much smooth in its in its profile and you have a swivel stud mount for for your bipod is that right that's correct yes um and, and then once again you know there's a lot of guys running chassis on these bolt mm -hmm. guns and whatnot um like I, a ruger precision rifle absolutely or, yeah. right right or the savage or the uh i think there's about three of them out there mm -hmm. now that, that come right from the factory uh that you can buy off the shelf that have the chassis systems yep. to them. I've never, I've never really uh, liked the chassis systems. It's just all in what you like and what you can make work for you. This, this rifle, I wanted it to be relatively light because I mm -hmm. use it for hunting as well. And uh, so this is what I ended up with. Yep. And as we discussed in the last video, w w when you do so much trigger time getting ready for a match and competing in a match, and then you take the same rifle and you take it out in the field and go hunting, it's, it's just great practice and good muscle memory. Absolutely, yes, <laughs> yes, especially if you're running a fairly light trigger like we are in this yep. one here, the dual trigger set at eight ounces, which is mm -hmm. extremely light compared to what most people like to use, but uh, I know I've shot, I think I have over 20,000 pulls on that trigger, yep. so I kind of have an idea when it's going to let go. So to, to, to recap on the rifle, pick a chambering, pick an action in terms of a bolt action versus semi-automatic, pick a, a, a profile and, and then, you know, think about what optic you want to run, of course. That's going to be one of the key things in a PRS match is, is what scope you're going to use. And Absolutely. Tell me about your thought process on that. So I think after doing this for a number of years, uh, a first focal plane is a must, as I sit here looking at my second focal plane, Night Force. <laughs> a first focal plane is a must without a doubt. Um, most, not all, but most uh, PRS shooters will run mils instead of minutes, um, which, which I believe is the right way to go as well. Mm -hmm. uh, Let's talk about first focal plane versus second focal plane. For those of you who haven't shot both, uh, a first focal plane uh, will scope will maintain the scale of the reticle in terms of your holdover throughout the range of magnification. Whereas absolutely. a second focal plane scope, the tick marks on on the reticle won't will only apply to that max magnification. Yes, that's correct. Yeah. And so you get to do a little math. Yeah, if you can't quite pick it up at 22 power on the top magnification here, then you drop down to 11 and cut everything in half. Mm -hmm. um, so there you go. Uh, that's why the, the first focal plane is for sure the way to go. Mm -hmm. The less that you have to think about and calculate in your head while you're under the gun, the better, right? <laughs> Absolutely, yes. Yep. yep. And there are some, some scopes that have uh, Horus reticle and so mm -hmm. forth where you don't have to dial at all. Once you learn how to use them, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, because your, your, your holdovers and your wind are all built into it. And once you learn that, you can go pretty fast. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's too busy for me, so I prefer just the standard yep. uh, uh, MLR reticle in this one. And you mentioned Mills versus MOA, and, and we've discussed this m numerous times. The key thing is that whoever you're shooting with, if, if you can align on MOA, versus mills, that's a good thing because then you're in the same conversational language. Uh, even if, you know, the guy on the spotting scope has mills and you have mills and your sh other shooting partner has mills, then you can you can talk in mills, right? Absolutely, yes. And Two that, tenths hold over for wind or, or whatever. Absolutely, and that, that's really, really important, which is what got me into shooting mills to start with is my uh, shooting partner back in 2000, 2001 was shooting mills and I was like, well, let's give that a try and so here I am. And then mm -hmm. like the spotting scope behind Gavin here is, mm -hmm. is first focal plane mills as well. Yep. So it makes it very, very easy to uh, call out corrections and so forth. Yep. Yeah, that, uh, that was a little bit of an issue uh, with my scope. This is the same Vortex Viper HST 6-24x50 that I was shooting on the Ruger Precision Rifle. 
and overall it worked great, but I didn't have the zero stop like you'd have on, on a Razer HD, that kind of thing. And uh, I didn't realize how important that would be until you start dialing out your dope multiple times and you're going out. We were shooting at between 100 yards and 700 yards. And uh, you never know when you might accidentally roll, roll your turret and then wonder, you know, if you're if you're really back on zero or not. So. Yes, that's correct. And in a, in a match setting, especially, then uh, things get kind of moving pretty fast, and mm -hmm. it's very nice to have the zero stop for sure. You're also running uh, sunshade. Yes, um, and and I, I wouldn't go any larger than that for mm -hmm. sunshade, just because just how I am. But but they are nice to have, especially you know you're shooting early in the morning, the sun's down low, coming up on you. And you're shooting into the sun. It's, it's very nice to have. So let's talk magnification range. For obviously, that's going to depend on what your PRS match consists of. But our match, like I said, consisted of 100 yards at, at the near edge and about 700 yards at the far edge. And you've got a 22 power scope, and I've got a 24 power scope. Um, is that a sufficient range? I believe so. This is a five and a half by 22. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's an old scope. I mean, it's it's several years old and definitely time for an upgrade. But um, the magnification range for me and for my eyes is really good. Hmm. Uh, some of the newer scopes are running up to 35 power on the top end. My eyes can't pick that up. So um, they get too much mirage and, and uh, distortion and that sort of thing, uh, especially running a can. Uh, you'll definitely get a lot more mirage off of the, the mm -hmm. can. So so there's some, there's some once again, goes, that goes to personal preference, in my opinion. Uh, you do want something that, that's got a decent range of mag magnification and the five and a half is is uh, more than adequate on the low mm -hmm. end 22 on a rare occasion i wish i had a little bit more but i'm definitely happy mm -hmm. with the 22. so we've got magnification range you've got uh the mills versus moa uh zero stop turret style some people have locking turrets we were both shooting non-locking turrets do you have a preference on that zero Probably. stop Absolutely need zero. Yep. This, this one's got the zero stop on it, yep. um, and this is a, what they call their high-speed turret. So mm -hmm. you've got uh, you got 10, 10 minutes per. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. sorry, ten mils per rev mm -hmm. eh, on the minutes. <laughs> so um, so high-speed turrets and uh, and zero stops are a must. Um, High-quality scopes. I th I think you could, if you don't have the budget to do uh, high-end scope, high-end rifle. I would go with a high-end scope over the high-end rifle. Mm -hmm. um, if you if you got a rifle off the shelf that's running like a 6.5 Creedmoor and a Ruger Precision rifle that's staying hovering about a half MOA with factory rifle ammunition off the mm -hmm. shelf, mm -hmm. then you're doing really really good. Then spend the money on optics. Yeah, and also have really really good rings or a really good mount because I don't know for me if I'm having trouble with groups. Seems like at least six times out of ten, it's a loose ring, a loose mount. Something's not holding, yes. and you can't afford to have that happen in in a match environment. Yeah. So, which kind of slight sidebar is uh, make sure you bring in your kit mm -hmm. a small a small tool bag that would uh, take care of being able to, to retorque the uh, mounts and mm -hmm. or the uh, the rings and so forth. Not yeah. a bad idea. I like to have a fat wrench on hand because it gives you the inch pound readings and then it Absolutely. clicks. And then, and then you know exactly you know where you're at, and not having to guess it. You're going to be tight enough, but you're not going to damage you know your your tube or anything like that. Correct. So that's always good. Okay, so we talked about the rifle and we talked about the optic. Those are obviously very important things. Let's talk about support, bags, slings, bipods, getting the rifle steady. Sure. So um, there are several bags available out there. Uh, Personally, I tend to run just a small rear bag, as mm -hmm. you can see underneath the, the butt stock of the rifle there. Yep. This um, is the Red Tac gear mm -hmm. yep. out of Spokane, out of Spokane Washington. Spokane. Is that right? Yes. Yep. And then uh, I have a tab sling and then a Harris bipod. And there's a, a slew of different options you have available mm -hmm. on that. Once again, use what's comfortable for you and actually works for you. And then, again, fits in your budget. There's uh, some bags out there, just the bags alone, that are two three hundred dollars so yeah if you choose to spend the money on the bags mm -hmm. it's there to be spent mm -hmm. for sure um, I, I can kind of see the benefit of having two sizes of bags because during during the the course of this event I shot with with my bag which is kind of medium size compared to yours and it's good for all-arounder 
But I tried the Game Changer bag, mm -hmm. which several of the guys were really big on, which had kind of a shelf on it. It was really dense and heavy, which was nice, a stable platform. And then the KYL gear bag, which was larger, really lightweight. But when I shot off of, I think it was the tank trap, it, it really worked very effectively to help me lock down. And I sure. thought, hey, that'd even be good for hunting when you need to you know, pack it through the woods, mm -hmm. you know, going back to using the same gear in a match environment that you're going to use out in the field. Absolutely. Some stuff that you can depend on. So mm -hmm. um, you could definitely, I think, get away with one bag and then just find the right size that's the right compromise between big for those awkward yeah, situations yes. where you need to take up a lot of space yes. and it's small enough to haul around. Absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And in terms of bipods, a lot of guys are using the, the Harris like we are. These are SBRMs 6 to 9s with the tension lock add-ons. Uh, other guys are using Atlas and there's, there's, there's other offerings as well. And I, I've heard kind of one of the trade-offs is speed versus flexibility because these bipods, the Harris, you know, fold up and fold down instantly, whereas the Atlas, you're going to be working a depressor button and got different right. notches and things right. like that. And then, but that again, go, that goes to what you're familiar with. And if you use mm -hmm. it a lot, you get familiar with it, you're fast with it, you know how it's going to work and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, and then once again, that how much money do you want to spend on a bipod? These Harris bipods with the, with the uh, lock on the back typically run around $80 to $100, mm -hmm. somewhere in there. Some bipods can run you right on up three, four hundred dollars. So, yep. how much money do you want to spend on a bipod? I would, I would say that this is probably the lowest that I would go. Mm -hmm. um, uh, the Harris has been around forever. They're really good to swivel a little bit. So uh, you've got some cant uh, that you can work with. They don't pivot. Um, they're simple, but they're quality. Yes, yes. So, so once again, you know, it depends what your budget is mm -hmm. and uh, and how far you want to go with that. And, and I always go back to if you have the extra money, spend it on the optics and work your way mm -hmm. around from there. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about ammunition in magazines. So I brought, I think we had eighty some odd rounds that we needed for for this match, I and I brought. So. I brought a box of 122 Nosler that I had loaded, you know, and actually I had another box in the truck, you know, just right, just right. in case. <laughs> you never know. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was using a, a Condor single rifle bag and everything pretty much that I used for the day fit in that and then I could kind of transfer that to a backpack. That's one thing that I would definitely bring next time would be just using a backpack and keeping all of, uh, all of the essentials kind of in that but yes. back to the back to the ammunition so how many magazines do you typically need well you you want a minimum of two and mm -hmm. three is not a bad idea if you have one go south mm -hmm. on you then you've got two because and typically yep. in a match you're gonna need two magazines yeah because we had the one situation where you either had to run and tap your magazine and come back and reload or you had to grab a separate magazine and obviously you want to have the ability to choose between those kinds of things. Or yes, for sure. And then also you have a magazine go down. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's better to have that spare magazine with mm -hmm. you. So not a bad idea. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, if you have some extra ammunition and someone else is in need, like if they have a 6.5 Creedmoor, you could definitely win some points there. Yes, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully everyone brings enough uh, ammunition, though. Yes. Uh, okay, so let's talk about one of the most important things in getting on target at different ranges, and that's your dope, right? All of the offsets and holdovers, all of the data that you need to to manage the different targets and the different environments. Absolutely, so so one thing you wanna do is verify your dope. Mm -hmm. And that means going out and shooting at different ranges uh, with the ammunition you're gonna use and verify that it is doing the drop that your, your drop chart's telling you it's going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, pretty easy to do, you, you don't necessarily have to shoot 50 yard increments from 50 yards on out to a thousand, mm -hmm. but you but you should maybe get your hundred yards zero for sure. And chronograph data, right? Chronograph data is very helpful. I mean, you can still do without it. I've, sure. I've shot for years and years without without having chronograph mm -hmm. my loads. Mm -hmm. And then go along and work your way back in and verify that your data is showing what the bullet's actually doing. Uh, then then you can build a good drop mm -hmm. chart off of that. And I found that using a G7 BC, which is more accurate over different ranges compared to a G1 BC. Right. Uh, we saw you had a good wind call for me and with the, the drop data that I had 
you know, calculated with the shooter app, I was only off by about that much at six, 600 yards yes. with the yes. with the 22 Nosler. So that was Correct. that was a good feeling. Yeah, yeah, that was really nice. It was a first round hit at 600 uh, right out of the gate, and that was, mm -hmm. you know, like I said, like he, like like Kevin said, a good wind call um, got him right on there first round hit. And I think you were maybe a tenth, tenth and a half lower. Than yeah, that. it was very, very rewarding for sure. Yeah, and it would have been a kill shot had we been hunting, right? Oh, I mean, absolutely. For for most big yep. big game or whatever. Absolutely. So you gotta you gotta be confident with your with your load. You need to know what that load is going to do in general. Get a good zero, um, and then you need to have the information available with you the day of the match as well. And what I did was I, I did a, a simple uh, dope card for the rifle that had 10 mile per hour wind in one column and then it had drop in another column and then it had the yardages and I think I went in 100 yard increments from 200 up on to 700 which was mm -hmm. the range that we had. Um, and then I had the shooter app available in case some conditions came up. You know we had an uncharacteristic uh, wind or something like that I could kind of redial. And then we've talked about, this is from Sunrise Tactical. This is their tactical arm board slash wrist coach. And this is something that you can put on your wrist and then just write your dope on it for, for each of the courses that you're going through. We had one called the Safari, mm -hmm. and that went from, what was the closest target Four, on that 485 one? out to 700. Yeah, mm -hmm. and there was four different targets. <clears throat> That's so correct. Yep. That, is, that was difficult, I will, I will admit, to... <laughs> To try and hit one target and then to dial in the dope for the next target, acquire the target, get on it, dial the dope for the next target, and so on and so forth. Right. That took that took a lot of concentration and and having something like this, the the arm board and, and wrist coach available is what gave me that confidence because you need it at a glance. <laughs> yes, yes. And most of that stuff you're not gonna just remember off the top of your head. So mm -hmm. Um, having it dialed in there or, or written in uh, on the armband makes it very, very fast uh, and efficient. Okay, so if you're confident with your rifle, you've got the right optic, you've got your dope, and you've got multiple ways to, to use that dope, what's next? How about some of the other accessories like <laughs> the, the binoculars and the rangefinders, that kind of thing? The binoculars and rangefinders are really handy uh, when, you're, when your squad is shooting and you're, say, two-thirds of the way back from, the, from being the next guy up. Mm -hmm. um, in most matches, not all, now, there are some that are completely blind where you don't get to watch. But if you're in a mm. match that they're not blind where you're allowed to watch, then binos are really, really handy. So you can kind of watch trace, you can watch uh, impacts, that kind of thing. Uh, it just gives you a feel for what's going on downrange. Um, and a range finder uh, is not a bad thing either. Sometimes even though all the ranges are known, for some reason, mentally, it's nice to hit that target with a rangefinder, mm -hmm. and just to, to get that out of your out of your mind, out of your subconscious. Yeah, if you have it with you, then you don't maybe have to go back to the practice score app and reread the notes or you know refer. Just, There's yeah, that too. Like you're right, saying, right? Double check is better than you know measure twice, cut once, right? Yeah, absolutely. You only get one chance to go up to the absolutely, fire. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. And so I I was using the the Bushnell Elite Tactical Mile rangefinder and Zeiss. 10 by 42, you actually have something even better. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was using the uh, the Geovoy 10 by 42 HDs, and uh, <laughs> they're really, really nice. They'll run out to uh, about 2,000 yards. So you can, um, you can, they're binoculars, but they have an integral rangefinder, which yes, that's it kind of brings the two things together. It's yes, amazing. which makes it very nice in that you have one, one optic you're yeah. uh, packing around instead of two. Yep. Um, and you don't have to, to switch either, right? I mean, this that's is correct, really right. nice. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then also when you're in these matches, especially the type that we shot uh, a month or so ago, um, you are going to be uh, required to help out in scoring and, uh, and watching targets and calling hits and misses. And that's where good optics such as these binos or the spotting scope come in real handy. Mm -hmm. So so that's, that's kind of a, a basic overview. Kind of what are you thinking about moving forward in terms of things that you've seen, things that you haven't tried yet, things that you'd like to use in a match in the, in the future in terms of gear? Well, for me, I definitely want to go to first vocal plane on the optics, mm -hmm. without a doubt. Uh, and that is, that is probably my next step up. Um, and then some of the newer bags that are out there, not quite sure which one I want to go with. Mm -hmm. I like the slightly heavier ones. I have a real, real light bag that's you know about like so. Mm -hmm. It's too light. Mm -hmm. I need some weight to it. 
and I don't mind packing the extra weight uh, even when I'm hunting. Wow. Um, but uh, so so like the game changer or the other bags that mm-hmm. you've mentioned earlier. Um, but I like a little bit more, a little bit smaller bag that'll fit in my packs. So when I'm mm-hmm. hunting and so forth. Shooting sticks is a whole different. That's a whole other uh, game out there on whether you need shooting sticks or want shooting sticks. But there's a lot of different like the trigger sticks and so forth. Um, there's some mono sticks or the the shooting sticks that I have or the trigger stick I have is a um, a tripod. Hmm. Um, so those those are available. Yeah, it's up to you whether you know whether you want to pack that gear around or not. Right. Yeah, I'd I'd kind of like to try a bolt gun. Having having done semi-auto, I think it'd be an interesting challenge to to try something different and you know to just get that bolt cycling action down super smooth and mm-hmm. not flinching, not moving, just holding rock steady. I think that'd right. be really fun. And then and then to try a, a heavier bullet in a larger diameter, you know, six mm-hmm. five probably six five Creedmoor. Why right, not? Right? right. Absolutely. Yeah. And that that <laughs> yeah. would be that would be awesome to do that for yep. sure. I agree. I agree on the bigger bag as well. I think mm-hmm. that would be uh, a good thing to have. Yeah, I think when uh, they were offering those for you to use out of the uh, out of our squad, um, which is very generous of them. I those think, guys were great. Yes, they I were. I must say. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, we we let them know up front that this was uh, Gavin's first match, and <laughs> and it was so nice because they just like instantly, oh here, you help help you this way and help you that way and so forth and it was uh mm-hmm. which is typical of these matches it's they're just yeah. everybody's there to help each other they 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 did their first match and they probably remember what that was like absolutely right right, so. right? <laughs> <laughs> no it's a great yeah. experience so there's another common denominator of where we want to both go deeper and it might not be you know related to prs for you but 22 nosler yes yeah so so <laughs> jim and i got ready for for the match and it, over the course of different practice sessions. I was using 223 in this rifle. This is the Air MPR rifle here. And then we were looking at the ballistics out at 700 yards and thinking, yeah, it's getting a little bit iffy. And a little bit of iffy is, is iffy when you're on a small target, right. you know? So we stepped up to the 22 Nosler. I've been really curious about this since it was launched at SHOT this year. And it made a big difference. It gave that extra bit of headroom over, over you know, the transonic range if you will uh shooting 70 grain rdf bullets they did super super well um i think that was kind of one of the highlights once i got my load data using the right powder and, and figured all that out unfortunately I had a couple of issues during the match but I have a really good h380 load mm-hmm. that, that's the shooting now uh i guess you felt the need to go and get your own huh actually i did yes i uh, <laughs> i purchased the new barrel and a couple i think 500 pieces of brass because yeah. I, I feel that uh that we were shooting, I was shooting my 5.56 five, loads uh, at the same time Gavin was shooting his 22 Nosler. And the, the 22 Nosler was definitely better uh, better on the drift and drop than the 5.56 five, loads, mm-hmm. which the 5.56 five, load is even uh, faster than, and higher performance than the 2.23 load. Mm-hmm. Um, and so the bat, I think the 5.56 five, load may be halfway between the two just from what we were seeing uh, when we're up, when we're practicing before I yep. threw you under the bus and went to the bolt gun. <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> However, so, yeah, yeah, so I'm looking forward to, to putting that rifle together. Yeah. And uh, I think it's going to be awesome for uh, for coyotes and uh, yep. maybe kook like the one I saw Saturday. I know, I can think of a lot of things that I, that I want to use 22 Nosler for. And, this is a good segue, stay tuned because I'm going to be going in depth on 22 Nosler talking about the cartridge itself talking about this sort of special cases. It's, it's a hot routed cartridge. It's got a rebated rim. It, it really is pushing the limits of the AR-15, which is kind of why I'm interested in it. Uh, performs really, really well. We'll go into reloading. We'll talk about ballistics. We'll talk about component selection. So lots of good stuff to look forward to, and I'm looking forward to having fun with you experimenting in in this new territory of, of 22 nozzler so stay tuned jim thanks again for coming um you're, i'm you're hoping welcome. to do another prs match and uh, i learned a lot i think the second time will go a lot better It'll be a lot of fun for sure yeah, absolutely <laughs> so stick around if you want to check out the 22 nozzler action make sure you're subscribed to my channel and if you liked this video please give it a thumbs up until next time happy shooting and happy reloading